Almighty Father, we thank you for the gift of life. It is on account of this that we can be part of this meeting today. Lord, we thank you for the salvation of our souls. This is what gives us the consciousness of whom you are and what you are in our lives. Lord, take the praise in Jesus' name. We thank you for the beginning of this meeting yesterday, which was such a wonderful one. Thank you for revealing your mind to us. Lord, as we make a progress today, we pray in a greater way you reveal yourself in the name of Jesus. Lord, as I bring your word to this house, I pray you give me utterance in the name of Jesus. Please, Lord, don't allow whom I am or what I know to color what you have on your mind for us today in the name of Jesus. Thank you, faithful Father. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. I thank God so very much for the privilege I have to stand uh, before this gathering of distinguished children of God to bring God's word. So I am more of a facilitator uh, because there are things we uh, uh, must have heard or read in the past. But as I facilitate this reminder, I pray God will use me uh, to do exactly what he wants us to learn in the name of Jesus. I celebrate God in the life of the leadership of this fellowship, concerned leaders and elders fellowship, uh, particularly our uh, Father in the Lord, uh, Reverend Emmanuel Adida Yoshit. Thank you, sir. Celebrate God in your life and the life of our mommy, mommy Grace Shed. And I celebrate God in the life of our mama in the house, uh, Reverend B.C. Ali. God bless you, mommy. And uh, as a matter of fact, every of our elders in the house, both male and female, I'm speaking on perilous times, perilous times. Uh, this term, perilous times, is found exactly this way in the book of uh, Second Timothy. We'll see that at this point, Paul was writing some notes to Timothy in chapter 1, in chapter 2, giving some specific instructions to his son, Timothy. And uh, particularly in chapter 2, uh, he exhorted Timothy to endure hardship like a good soldier of Christ and a husband man. In that same chapter 2, he charged him to commit the great trust which he had received to faithful men. Paul went on to warn him to shun babblings and uh, dangerous errors of the time and the time to come. Still in that chapter 2, he charged him to flee youthful lusts. We know this scripture very well. And to minister with zeal against error. These were the key things Paul said to Timothy in chapter 2 of 2 Timothy. And then there was a full stop at the end of that chapter. Crossing to chapter 3, Paul made something very clear. He made it clear to Timothy the inevitability of the perilous times, the characteristics of men during the perilous times. Those were the things he made known to Timothy in the, the third chapter. But then, something struck me there from verse 1. This know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. Now, take note of the first few words. This know also. Now, to grammarians, you get to know that know also is making something clear. That there are things you had known. But there is something you must know in addition to what you have known. I've given you charges, I've warned you, I've encouraged you, I've challenged you on what to do in verse 2, I mean chapter 2, which you suffice. But there is a very important knowledge you must have. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. In addition to all I had said in chapter 2, know also, have this very important information. So just mentioning this in verse 3 will not connote that what he was mentioning in chapter 3 was of less importance to what he mentioned in chapter 2. He had given all the essential things he thought he needed to give to Timothy 
in chapter 2. But then something very, very important, something key, something that might make a shipwreck of all he had said to him, if he did not add, was what he added in chapter 2. That is, my lay none, not this too, that in the last days, perilous times will come. And then we begin to wonder, what do we mean by perilous times? The American Standard Version lets us know that it means grievous times. Grievous times. New Living Translation says, very difficult times. The Amplified Bible says, times of great stress and trouble. In the church of our days, mentioning things like this may sound anti-faith. You know, we confess everything positive. Hallelujah, it is well. I will be the head on the tail. It's well with me in my going out, coming in. Great, scriptural. But anything that sounds negative, we don't want to hear. But in Yoruba, Paul, Ola Mole, perilous times will come. Grievous times. Times of great difficulty. Times of real, big, great stress and trouble. This time is likened to the injury time in the game of football. You know, we have the regulation time, 45 minutes in the first half, 45 minutes in the second half, and then there is what we call the injury time. And the injury time is at the behest of the referee. It's the one who decides how long the injury time will last. Usually the injury time are the times when there are stoppages. Maybe there's an injury, take care of a player, or there are crises, a player is quarreling with another, and they have to stop the game, or there are other issues. The referee will take notes and add the same time at the end of the regulation time. So we are in the injury time. And I've discovered something about the injury time even in the game of football. It's usually the time of vicious attacks. Desperate defenses. You are desperate about defending your team. You are vicious about attacking your opponent. You want to make the best of the few minutes. So the time in which we are is likened to the injury time. We are in God himself is the only one who can determine how long this time will be. And I've discovered something. Matches lost in injury times are usually more painful than the ones lost in regulation time. Do we agree with me? If you had played for 90 minutes and it's 0-0, zero, zero, and you think you are going home with a draw, and the referee adds five minutes injury time. The first minute of the five minutes, nothing happens second, third minute, in the fourth minute, but in the fifth minute, your opponent scores against you. It can be very, very painful. Do you agree with me? So, beloved, we have been holding on since you got born again. Then it's not worth it losing this match in the regulation time, I mean, in the injury time. The last days, the perilous times. And still in that verse 1, it says, perilous times shall come. Not may come. Not can come. And shall, grammatically, is stronger than will. Grammarians will know this. Shall come. It is a certainty, not a probability, not a possibility. It is one time that shall actually come. And either though we had heard the end is near, I'm tempted to submit that the end is now here, no longer near. Oh, today, the end is actually here. You'll agree with me in a short while. Paul went on to list characteristics of men. What you see in the lives of men in the perilous times. And actually, in verse 4, he listed 18. And he added one in verse 5. 18 in verses 3 and 4, sorry. And in verse 5, he added one very, very big one. Which we'll try to narrow down to as we move on in this short discourse. Number one, he said they will be lovers of their own selves. That is, selfishly care about their own interests alone. You find this in our world today. Everybody cares more about himself. Hi, me, myself. And unfortunately, you find this even in the body of Christ. I was listening to somebody, something on Facebook, something fresh. 
a man from uh, beloved uh, white garment churches lambasting another man of God from the Pentecostal setting. Lambasting. Because the uh, renowned man of God, very, very renowned in Nigeria, maybe made a remark that did not go down well with the white garment churches. And this man made a video of one hour, 20 minutes from the beginning in Yoruba, lambasting this man of God. If I mention the name of the man of God who was lambasting, you shake your head. There was no vulgarity that he did not mention. In Yoruba, you could know it can be heavy. But you see that. From one hour, 20 or 30 minutes, you need to bear. Are you fighting for this same Christ that the other man stands for? So lover is just selfish about his own church, his own denomination. And perhaps the man who made a remark there, I wouldn't know what the motive is, but he believes his own setting is the correct one too. So even in the church, lovers of their own selves, even in families, you have men that care about their own uh, pleasure, their own peace, more than that of the wife and the children. They can leave the family and go out and enjoy while the family is suffering in lack. Covetous. Paul equally told Timothy that his lovers of money because of the influence which riches can produce covetous. Boasters. These are people who are vainglorious, self-assuming, valuing themselves beyond all others. Perilous times indeed. Boasters. Boasting on the pulpit. Jesus is no longer on the front burner. What we want to do is that we are the biggest, we are the highest. My cathedral is the biggest. My congregation is the biggest. Boasters. All I needed to do was to raise my hand. Everybody was falling under the anointing. Boasters. Even my shadow will do the miracle. I don't need to be there. Boasters. And then we gab it in some kind of piety. That to the glory of God, I know I am the most anointed man in the country today. Boasters. Perilous times are here indeed. Proud. Those who love to make a show of self, status, and possessions. Proud. One of the characteristics of men in the perilous times, according to Paul. And you find this in our days. That's why he said, indeed, the end is not really near again. It's here. It's actually here. Blasphemous. Those who speak without reverence for God and secret things. What never obtained in the days of yore, we find in our own days. We are a man of God. We hand over his microphone on that sacred altar to somebody who will come and make mockery of the name of Jesus in the name of comedy. And you find Papa in the Lord throwing his leg up, laughing, ha, 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 ha. Eh? Making jests even of the, the, the sacred tongues we speak. Making jests of the name Jesus. I woke up one day. I found Jesus in my room. He told me he was hungry. I gave him a mala. And Jesus said he doesn't want Amala. And people will be laughing in the church. Not in the cinema. Not in the theater. Not in the hall in town. Blasphemers. Those who speak without reverence for God and sacred things. Disobedient to parents. Stubborn children whom their children cannot persuade. Just a lot. A woman was lamenting. Uh, I had a privilege of ministering outside the country last week. And a, a woman came, she sat. I could see, tears were not running out of her eyes, but I could see she was bleeding inside. Just because of one son that had gone wayward. A son that would call the mother almost twice or thrice a day. And now, for months, he had refused to call the mother. He had refused to pick the mother's... The boy had gone wayward in Germany, whereas the woman was living, I mean, is still living in the U.S., she could no longer persuade him. She said, oh, you bury by. We have them around. You see, disobedient to parents. Unthankful. Those who think they have a right to the benevolence of God and men. For this reason, they feel no obligation for gratitude. And it is easy to slide into unthankfulness. One of them is this. When you sleep and you wake up, 
and you refuse to give due benevolence to God in gratitude, then you are being unthankful. And the mindset is this. Why will I not wake up? Why will I not wake up? It's just normal. And I keep telling people, every night you sleep is a rehearsal on how to die. Because you don't know where you are. That's why you find a mother, I want to take care of my baby. I will stay with him. My So there is a God there. How many of us have ever been woken up by an alarm before? You set an alarm for a certain time and the alarm woke you up. Please, can you wave, wave your hand? Praise God. I did several in my, during my last trip. But you know very well that it wasn't the alarm that actually woke you up. Otherwise, place the alarm beside the dead body in the mortuary and see whether it will wake you up. It will wake up. Of course not. So alarm can't be in your journey. So ultimately, it's the spirit of God in us that is still alive in us that says, oh yeah, the day. So we should be thankful. When we are unthankful, it's a sign of the perilous times. And there are people who fall into this category, but this should not be found amongst children of God. Unholy, that is without piety, having no heart reverence for God. Unholy, unholy, no reverence for God at all. No fear for God. Even where we call the house of God, you see what people do there. What we call the house of God. They know the Bible so much to know that the house of God is so different from any house. You realize it's not like that. It's a sanctuary. What they do there. No reverence again. Can a woman be chewing gum or a man in the church of God? Can you be chatting and talking when the word of God is going on? How can you be checking updates? Who is winning between Manchester United and Chelsea while the preaching is going on? No reverence for God again. Unholy. We are indeed in the perilous times. Without natural affection. And what Paul was actually mentioning here is the affection of a parent to a child and a child to a parent. That affection is lost. That's what he was in context. That's what he was talking about here. No natural affection again. The news was all over the media of a boy that was caught with an adult head in his hand. Adult head. And the only Hashemi Jeje Majewo, Boloti Rori, Olori Mama Unni. Kilo Efiche, Oni Kou Mfi Tun Agbara Ro For Yahu Power. The son. Killed the mother and beheaded her. No natural affection. The natural affection will make you cherish, if no other person, at least your parents. Now the person who could cut off the head of his mother, whose head will he not be able to cut off? We are in the perilous times. No natural affection. Just the love I have for a fellow human being that I don't want to injure or hurt him. It's no longer there. So I can, anybody can hurt anybody. The perilous times indeed. Truth breakers. Those who are never bound by any promise or oath. They readily promise anything because they never intend to perform in the first place. They can break any promise. And they are quick to make promises because they don't have the intention of fulfilling the promises in the first place. The story was told of a man of God who had labored in ministry, a sincere man of God. And they believed it was time for them to have a structure, at least a meeting place. And they went looking for a parcel of land. He got one and the owner was an Alaji, a Muslim. So he spoke to the man, we are interested in this land. church. You know I'm a Muslim, I know. And the man of God said, I mean, the allergy said, I don't know why. I will sell the land to you. And he told him the price. Incidentally, this man of God could not raise the amount. So what he could raise was a deposit. And he said, our church should do her best over a certain period to pay the balance. The allergy said, me, mankato to shele. O kamisha back in tafuni, eloa balance wa. And over a period of time, the man in prayers with the church members were praying and lo and behold, when the money was complete, he came back. And the allergy told him, sit down. He said, do you know something happened? While you were away looking for the balance, just a few months, I mean weeks after that, somebody came and said he was interested in the parcel of land. And the man was a pastor like you. 
But I told him that I had promised you and you have gone to look for the balance. Do you know what this, your fellow pastor said? He said, how much did this man offer you? I told him, and he said, you multiply by three and pay now. Sell it to me. But the man said as an allergy, listen. I will dare not sell it to another person. And I told him to go away. Man of God, I want to warn you. Listen to this. Beware of your fellow pastors. That's an allergy admonishing a pastor to be careful of another one. Truth breakers. I'm not talking of unbelievers. I will multiply. I will make it times three and pay you now. Return this money to him. That's the kind of thing we have. We are in the perilous times. False accusers. Slanderers. Striving ever to ruin the characters of others. False accusers. People that will just sit down and fashion or something to destroy another person's name. Let me tell you as a believer, if the accusation is even true, you should not be the one that will help spread it. Not to talk of an accusation that is false and you just generate it. Or the one you are not sure of, you help them to carry it. It's not correct. But it's happening because we are indeed in the end times. False accusers. I have quite a number to look at, but if uh, my time expires wherever, I will stop. And I know God will breathe on the much we could do. Incontinent, those who lack strength, hence readily yield to the demands of the flesh. Incontinent. You know when you talk of incontinence in medicine? It has to do with the urinary control of the bladder. When you can't control your bladder again and uh, urine leaks out, then they say the such person is incontinent. So in this context, incontinence means you lack strength. You readily submit to the demands of the flesh. Whatever the flesh tells you to do, you find yourself doing it. Then you go back to begging God to have mercy. You know, you are just incontinent. This is one of the signs of the perilous times. Fierce. That's another thing Paul mentioned. That is wild, harsh, rough and cruel to others without an iota of gentleness. Daddy mentioned in his teaching yesterday that as a leader of a church, as a set man, does not mean you should be hard on people. You should not become a taskmaster, treating people like slaves. We have people who are in the positions of authority, under the authority of Jesus, leading men and women. But we are rough, we are wild. We don't treat people with respect. We don't treat them with regard. Well, no problem. This is one of the signs of the perilous times. Fears. Despisers of those that are good. Number 14 that he mentioned there. That is those who are averse to goodness and speak ill of the good of others. Any good other people do, they speak ill of them. They find a way to puncture every good testimony they hear about others. Just to put a hole there. Oh, great things happen in that meeting. Come and see raw miracles. Wow, I've never seen that kind in my life. And what will come out of this kind of person is, uh, I'm on Kadawmatadasini. Despisers of those who are good. It's not every rich man that went into rituals. Because your own riches will come. If in God's own time. So don't speak ill of any fine vehicle you find on the street going uh, No, that's not true. Because your own will soon come and you won't love to be called an ole. Despisers of those that are good. 15. Traitors. That is those who betray others. And their father you very well know is Judas Iscariot. Traitors. Heady. Those who are puffed up with a high opinion of themselves. Aduru me. Hold me. Who, who are you? We invited a man to feature in our movie. I'm talking of years ago. The movie actually is Once Upon a Time. And he took a role that put him there in the spotlight. And the man enjoyed the spotlight. He said he went somewhere one day. And the way people were looking at him, treating him as if they did not know whom he had become. He said he had to ask them, uh -uh, don't you know me? Just because he featured in a movie. We had, he had become popular all of a sudden. Don't you know me? And he said his ego was bruised and his puffiness was punctured. 
When the person said to him, I don't know you and I don't want to know you. Go down. <laughs> he told me himself. He said he learned a lesson not to puff up again. By God's grace, we had made many movies before then. Inviting him. We had been featuring in many movies. So I want to ask you, ah, puff up. I want to ask you, who can share your account? You buy it, man. Don't you know me? I'm very good answer. I don't know you and I don't want to know you. Puffiness. Even in the body of Christ. You feel you are too big for some assignments. How can you treat me like that? High-minded. Those who are full of themselves and empty of all good. Then 18. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Sensual gratification and vain amusement are their life pursuits. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. And in verse 5, he mentioned one. He added it. He said, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such, turn away. Paul said to Timothy, the New Living Translation renders that verse 5, they will act religious, but they reject the power that could make them godly. Hmm. Listen to the Message Bible. They will make a show of religion, but behind the scenes, they are animals. They make a show of religion. That's our heart. That translation is, behind the scene, they are animals. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. One of the characteristics of men in the perilous times. So what do they have? He said they have a form of godliness. In other words, a mere external show of religion. Pretentious piety and holiness. Outward righteousness. An ordinary facade. That is deceptive appearance. They appear to be what they are not. And the identities of men in these times, we have, at least in belie amongst believers, we have cold Christians. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. I don't have time to explain that. We now have cold Christians. Cold Christians. And the devil has a way of making people become cold Waxing cold is taken from the analogy of the candle. When you set a candle aflame, it doesn't go down at once. It's gradually that it will wax out. That's what it means, waxing cold. The wax will go down, then the wick will burn out. Then what had been hot, either two, you can pick with your hand, it becomes cold. That's the analogy there. The love of many will wax cold. Blessed be God, the Bible did not say the love of all. So many there's always remnant. It's our desire to be part of the remnant. Satan has his way of making people become cold. A man became the pastor of the church after his father's passage. The elders agreed they should step into the shoes. And just the Sunday after, he realized that the pulpit was placed to one side. That was where the pulpit had been while his dad was alive. While the daddy put it there, he did not know. But a great connect with pulpit, you see, the choir was on the other side. He beneath that, this man preached all through his life. But when he came up, he discovered that place should not be ideal. Let me put it in the center of the podium. But the church elders said, no, this is where it had been all along. It should be there. And the boy, I mean, the young man who wanted to respect them, he returned the podium there. But in his heart, he wanted it to be in the center. And the man devised the means. Every weekend on Saturday, we'll come to the church. Move the podium by one foot close to the center. Saturday again, go to the Sunday, I took it by one foot. Nobody realized anything was happening until the podium was in the center. No human being knew what happened. That's what the devil does. Shifting, dear, dear, dear. Oh, no more I will need law, I will need son. Waxing cold. Now, do you know your prayer life becomes zero, fasting life goes down, poor personal Bible study life, zero commitment to personal evangelism, loss of interest in fellowship with other believers. In fact, you need to be encouraged, persuaded, forced, called by the pastor, the pastor's wife, your unit leader before you come. And when you miss fellowship, you begin to ask, She won't bury me. Tamba bury me. They want to leave any church, eh? brother. You are waxing cold. You that should be the HOD of visiting unit. That should be visiting other brethren. You now cross your leg at home. Talo bury me. You are waxing cold. 
No interest in vineyard service, except there is enumeration. Nobody can convince me at any point in time that it's correct to pay people for playing instruments in the church. I'm just adamant, except the church decides, but no person should place a charge on me as a pastor. Why will I pay the usher that comes before you came, that will remain after you have gone? Just because you came to play keyboard for three minutes, uh, or 15 maximum, then you, you put me, no, no, no. If as a believer you do this, go and check yourself again. You have what you do on a daily basis. You earn who to take care of yourself, but you must be paid to come and play in the church of God. Your love is waxing cold. What of the prayer team? Who will pay them? What of the church cleaners? They will become dirty by the end of the day. So I just mentioned the others. Shameless Christians. We have confused Christians. We have materialistic Christians. But how to survive the perilous times? I will jump there. Acts 2.40 And with many other words, they did testify and exhort, saying, save yourself from this untoward generation. Save yourself. That was the instruction. Barare, save yourself from this untoward generation. That's why the Bible says, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Preserve yourselves from the influences of the end time. Only your gima bad image should be your watchword. Because you know where you are going to. It's not everybody in the garage that is going to the same place you are going. There are thousands there. There are uh, pickpockets there. There are those who have just come to watch around. There are those who have come to loiter. And when they call Lagos, Lagos, they will not enter the car. Because they are not going to Lagos. So in the world today, it's not everyone that has a mind of going to heaven. But you save yourself. And finally, number two, Philippians 2.12. Wherefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Sounding like the first one. Work out your own salvation. We must be diligent in the use of all means that lead to our salvation to persevere therein. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And know that you are saved today is not the ultimate. You must be ultimately saved by making it to heaven. And I'll close with this story. Uh, I was going to the uh, bank one day. Uh, I had a check I had signed. It's a check that requires two signatories. The other person had signed this portion. I appended my own signature and filled it. It was getting to 4 p.m. <laughs> if I pick the car, I wouldn't be able to make it to the bank before 4 because of traffic. So I decided to hop on an Okada, a commercial motorbike, to get me to the bank. And the young man did a good job. He meandered through the traffic and got me to the bank gates five minutes to four. And I was so glad I made it there. As I made for the security door, I put my hand in the pocket to bring out the check, only to discover I left it on the table. Wow. I felt annoyed at myself. If it had been my account alone, you know, I would go and find a way to do it in the bank. But it had to be duly signed by two. Filled, signed. I went with boldness only to discover I had forgotten it. Of course, I couldn't carry out that transaction and it was a Friday. And as I left, God told me, well, you are pained. But this is how some people will get to heaven to discover they lost their salvation along the way, that they lost it. And I, that was a comfort for me. The message I got comforted me. I was no longer annoyed as per the check that God, I got it. So beloved, this is a challenge to us that we should not get lost with the perilous times. And I pray the Lord will uphold us and sustain us in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Thank you for your time.